Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Nicole Horry. In our show this time, we'll take a trip to Maui and see some of the energy facilities there. We'll visit the Oahi Wind Farm at Ulupalakua, a Pacific biodiesel sunflower field in central Maui, and the Maui Electric Control Center that monitors power throughout the island. Fred Riddell, Energy Commissioner of Maui, organized the itinerary. Thanks, Fred. We were also joined by Todd Kanja of Hawaiian Electric Companies and Chris Reynolds of Maui Electric. They were all great and all were very knowledgeable and experienced in the generation and distribution of electrical energy and renewables on Maui. After an early flight and of course a stop at Krispy Kreme Donuts, we drove to the Oahi Wind Farm on the Ulupalakua Ranch near the southeast corner of Maui. The area is remote and spectacular. The wind turbines were beautiful to watch in design, function, and in their harmony with the landscape. Right here we have a large wind farm supplying energy to, uh, to Maui Electric and then to the citizens of Maui County. Um, it's um, about 21 megawatts of wind, uh, currently uh, operated by SEMPRA. A significant portion of uh, the renewable portfolio standards met by wind on Maui. Let's talk about the RFP that Hawaiian Electric has, 400 uh, megawatts, and that's not low, limited to Oahu, that's all over the state. Uh, the RFP is really designed to take advantage of the available federal tax credits and um, try to take what renewables we can um, on our grid. The technologies have continued to get more and more cost effective and we continue to see more uh, lower prices. The thing that we're also seeing now is really a piece that is going to be a part of our energy future, which is energy storage and we're encouraged by how the prices have come down very rapidly in the near term. Um, part of the, what we're doing with this RFP is to ask developers to look into storage and give us pricing for storage. Hawaii Island is already, I think they're over 56%, if I'm not mistaken, um, as of today. Uh, Maui's well over 30%, 30 I think closer to, to about 35%. Um, Oahu's just over 20%. We do have a goal. We want to start um, and, and put a little emphasis on Molokai. We think there's a great opportunity. Batteries can do multiple functions, one of which is to smooth the output of the wind farm. Um, the other thing it can do is, for example, it can store energy um, in periods when there may be an excess and discharge those batteries when um, there's peak demand. How do you pick your moment to get the technology that fits you um, without having anxiety about it being replaced in the near term? And what we try to do in our power supply improvement plan is to come up plans where we're not betting the farm all at one time, um, develop plans that and actions where if we take these actions um, that we're going to have very low regrets and that's what we're trying to do. Um, the one thing that we know for sure, at, at least at this point, is that federal tax credits are available. Um, and that's certainly what we're interested in, in trying to take advantage of. And if they do not do not get renewed, um, it's something that is going to disappear. Wind turbines have gotten larger and can actually produce more um, You know, out of a larger wind turbine. These wind turbines here are, are 3 megawatts. but. They do go up as, as much as, for example, seven megawatts uh, per wind turbine. Wow. Solar is pretty predictable, um, but like anything, too much of one thing makes it challenging. Uh, for example, if a portfolio were entirely solar, um, you can only use so much energy that um, as solar is being produced, which means you end up with a lot of energy storage. Wind, on the other hand, is something that could be available um, around the clock. Um, so the amount of storage that you actually need with wind is, is going to be less. I'm the technical manager for SEMPRA and uh, we support the Hawaii wind farm out here. As it connects up to the grid, uh, it connects with uh, a battery. What's the purpose of that battery and how does that help, uh, help the grid? Uh, because the wind is, as you know, it comes and goes as it likes, right? There's no control over them. If the wind comes in, then we can control how fast power is uh, getting to the grid. But if the wind goes away, then there's really no way to mitigate for it. So you lo the loss of power or intermittency generated from loss of wind can wreak havoc on the grid. So the battery purpose of the battery is to, so when the wind dies down, we can actually control how fast it, uh, the power actually falls. So we have a ramp, a ramp rate limitation, uh, approximately one megawatt per minute. And so that way, 
Maui Electric can actually bring up their generators fast enough to catch it to minimize the impact on the grid. How does the interconnection work from here to where you get it? So basically the power is generated here. Uh, they have a transmission line that goes up over the mountains. Um, it connects into a substation where the energy is stepped up in voltage, connected to our 69 kV transmission system and distributed to Maui. If you feed this in with all the other sources, is this above or below the other sources? The other sources are, are conventionally the fossil fuel generation. It's a, in a constant flux based on fuel pricing. What this really offers is, is a price stabilization. So we're on a fixed contract with, with fixed pricing. There's tremendous benefit in that because you know exactly what it's going to be for a period of years. Yes, exactly. Have you had to curtail them in recent years? Unfortunately, yes. We are an island system, so there's no way to export this excess energy. So we need to meet our customers' needs at any given time. So right now, if there's really no demand for electricity and there's excess generation, there is curtailment. If I had more batteries, if I were them and I had more batteries, I could just pump it all into the batteries during that period of time and not lose anything, yeah? Th that is an option. Um, batteries still are quite expensive um, and they're a, a big capital investment. Looks like a booth up there with windows. Is it, can a person be there? Is there a control room there or something? Not, not so much as the control room, is there is an access for um, maintenance to be done. There's a couple of landings that you go up to the top, certain, a couple of, you know, probably, I think there's two landings on the way up, and that's where you can rest if you need to. I'm sure I would have to. <laughs> They're very spacious inside. Some of the other turbines, like, uh, that has gearboxes in them, it's very cramped space. There's actually a wind vane up top. And through the wind vane, it measures where the, the top predominant wind direction is, or the average wind direction is. And actually, there's uh, what they call yaw motors that kicks in and actually turns the whole turbine to face the wind at all times. So it, it constantly adjusts itself as the wind direction changes to constantly trying to face the wind to, to maximize the power from the wind. So we're standing here on this point of land right under the turbines, and it's blowing up a storm, it's, it's, and it's consistent wind, but it's strong wind. I hope it doesn't affect our sound too much, actually. Is it like this all the time? Yes, sir. That's why we're here. <laughs> From there, we drove back to central Maui to see one of the Pacific Biodiesel sunflower fields in that area at the Maui Tropical Plantation Center. And we caught up with Bob King of Pacific Biodiesel. So what can you tell me about this field here? Uh, it's a, it looks like a young field of sunflowers. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Pacific Biodiesel has going on here? Well, here at Maui Tropical Plantation, we wanted to do a little, uh, a little small planting for people to just come and enjoy and see what's going on at the bigger fields, which are across the street and, and down the road a little ways. So this is the kind of sunflower, the same variety that we're planting uh, um, in our big fields, but it's a, it's a, it's a little field. How is this sunflower any different than, um, say, another one? Is this one specific for uh, creating fuel, creating other products? What, what can you make out of this, and how would it be perhaps different than the sunflower seeds that I might get from the grocery store? There's two main types of sunflower um, seed or sunflower plants. One grows um, the large confectionery sunflowers, and that's what uh, we use for for eating, for you know, the package you buy in the store, it's also the preferred one for bird feed and and things like that. It's um, the large seed. Uh, this is what they call black oil sunflower, which is it's not black oil; it's black sunflower seeds that makes oil. <laughs> so uh, they they're smaller. Um, they do make bird feed out of it as well, but most of it is made for the oil industry, for cooking oil and and um, biofuel. What other products can you use, say the stock, other things? How much of, of it is actually going towards that? And are there derivative products, something extra that you can make out of it? Well, it's interesting, every part of the sunflower is edible. So um, you can actually, I've talked to some, uh, uh, some folks that um, as kids on the mainland would peel the, the uh, uh, stalks apart and, and uh, chew on the kind of foamy inside core like popcorn. Um, not for me, but it's, it is edible. Every part of the plant is edible. Uh, I've done chips out of the leaves 
um, kind of like kale chips. You can make sunflower chips. Um, and then, of course, the, the seed, once we, once we crush the oil out of the seed, the, what's left over, the meal, sunflower meal, is a very high quality animal feed. Tell me a little bit about the water use and how you actually you know, farm sunflowers. Is it much different than other farming on Maui? Yeah, irrigation has been, is, is, a little, is quite a bit different. So they, for this small field, um, uh, Grant put it in with drip because it's manageable and you don't have to have water spraying around when people are walking around. Uh, for our fields, we don't use drip. Um, and, and it's mainly there's enough drip tape in the ground out there. We have, you'd have to peel it up. For me, you have to take it out every time you use it. We go with um, above ground sprinkler irrigation in the summertime, but our real, uh, what we're really finding is that um, to use the weather. So um, some of our, we're, we're going in with a lot of acres in the wintertime here when, as soon as we get rain and we'll call what's what we call dry land cropping, which is where most crops are grown in the world. It doesn't mean it's dry, it just means you're not adding irrigation. How about for you know, the county and for, the, for jobs and resiliency? It seems like there's a lot of benefit to actually growing a product, whether it, it results in a fuel or another product, a chip or, or a cosmetic, who knows what it might you know, ultimately be. It really seems like there's a lot of benefit to having smart agriculture in the county. When you make products from ag, it's basically labor. There's not that many inputs into it. It's the sun, it's the earth. Um, so it really does create jobs and, and payroll. Um, so, and it goes on and on. You know, you quit, quit hiring people, you quit farming. <laughs> so it's, there's no end to it. And, and we think they're good jobs when you get to, I mean, the parts that we're trying to do are big mechanized farms. And that means that rather than, you know, uh, bending over and pulling stuff out of the ground the hard way, which is, well, I, I got to thank people for doing that because I love my lattice and <laughs> things, but we're doing it with big equipment that's got air conditioning and biodiesel engines. And uh, um, so they're good jobs, they're technical jobs. And um, I think there's thousands of jobs that can be created and, and on down the line. So the cosmetics, the food grade oils, the, the co-products, um, and not all of these are gonna be oil bearing, they're gonna be other similarly farmed food products. You're selling sunflower products. What do you sell and to whom? Well, we, on the sunflower product side, we're developing a few, few different things right now. Um, we're, we're really thinking that the food grade oil for, you know, for salad oil or cooking is, is gonna be a, uh, was going to be the, our big product, but then we realized that the cosmetic um, industry is really likes it. So um, right now we're selling everything into the cosmetic market. To close out our visit to Maui, we went to the Maui Electric Control Center. It's in the Miko yard in Kahului. It monitors the sources and distribution points on the Maui grid. The display design is modular, so when the grid changes, it's easy to change the wall-sized, real-time display. You start in energy and then you find something out and you use that for some other completely unrelated purpose. <laughs> and, and the whole thing is a kind of continuum. It's wh whatever you can innovate, you innovate. <laughs> Absolutely. I think farmers are the original innovators. I, I really like the idea of um, locally sourced products to ag, continuing the ag business on in, in Maui, so it's just seems like a win-win solution where we can keep the agricultural business going and and still can support our energy needs here on Maui. I think just the innovation aspect is just fantastic you know and just to see um, people willing to try to innovate and and try to create value uh, out of agriculture that's 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 very creative and very innovative. To make it you know work out the economics have to pan out in the end and um, you know, the more derivative products and the more value that you can extract out of that, the better off you are. This is our dispatch room for Maui Electric. So basically, this is office is manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, holidays, weekends, all the time. We usually have at least three persons on staff at all time. We have the supervisor, we have a dispatcher, and we have the system generation operator. So basically, this half of the room 
primarily looks after the transmission distribution side. And, and this seat over here is the system generation operator. So basically he handles the, the coordination of the power plant generators at Kalui Malaya, along with the wind farms and the PV facilities on Maui. There's constant decisions being made about making sure that we're maintaining frequency and voltage across the system, making sure there's power, and we're delivering it safely to our customers. So meanwhile, you know, there's big roles in trying to coordinate as available generation. So when the wind's up and blowing and the sun is out shining, we're making sure that we can accept as much of that energy as we can by regulating our, our diesel generators down. And that board tells the whole story. For a frequency of 60 hertz, and right there we're at 60.00 hertz. Um, so right now we are, we are perfectly balanced between generation and customer usage. When anything changes on here, the lights start flashing. Uh, we get audible alarms, so we know we can address that situation as quickly as possible. So where is Ulupalakua, where we just visited? Where is that on the board? That's right down, um, it says Oahi right there. Yeah. And there's a digital readout that says uh, minus 16.8. Yeah. That means they're feeding into the system 16 megawatts, close to 17 megawatts. So basically, we actually have visibility over all three islands we're responsible for. So we have SCADA control and visibility for Maui, Molokai, Lanai. This is much more complex than I would have imagined, actually. It gets easier after 20 years, doesn't it? What it looks like to me is um, a whole bunch of microgrids waiting to happen. Microgrids, um, that's certainly a possibility. But again, it all comes down to ensuring that we're able to provide reliable, cost-effective service to our customers. Whether or not a microgrid is able to achieve that um, is, is probably the biggest question. Yeah, looking out in that direction there, it looks like it's almost its own microgrid or could be islanded on the island. Currently, we do have uh, ability to actually service HANA uh, through transmission or sub-transmission lines. Um, it's one of those things that if we were to convert it to a microgrid, in doing so, what benefits are we able to provide the customer? I think in certain cases, and there are um, some cases that we're looking at, not actually on Maui right now, that we do have older transmission infrastructure that needs to be replaced. And then the question then becomes, is it cheaper to replace transmission um, type equipment or is it cheaper to do a microgrid? We're looking towards the electrification of transportation. Um, a lot of uh, electric vehicles. It would seem to me that uh, given the power demand of a lot of those vehicles, let's just say that we're talking about the charging aspect, not maybe other values it might bring, that you're going to need quite an expansion of that or other technology. What, what do you see as a, the best way to bring more electric vehicles into um, onto the island? Um, what we want to do is basically avoid the peak usage periods. So what we don't want to do is have charging of EVs at a time where customers are using electricity for other uses, whether it be for business purposes or when you first get home when our, when our peaks usually occur. So I think in terms of charging, we want to do it when there's excess energy available. Uh, typically that happens in the midday when there's a lot of solar um, generation or perhaps in the early morning where we, we have our units turned down to minimum and there could be instances where we have excess wind energy available. So what we want to do is take advantage of those time frames and basically charge those vehicles then. Perhaps workplace charging then or something where, where you had the ability or I could come with my phone and my car and I could say, I'm going to leave by 5 o'clock, let the utility charge my car sometime between 9 and 5. Exactly right. So I think what we want to do is be smart about the times that we're charging the vehicles um, and have the ability to actually, and programs that will incent customers to charge when energy is, is abundant and um, especially from renewable resources. We talked with Fred Riddell by Skype later on one of our talk shows for a retrospective on the trip. From an electrical generation standpoint and from the RPS, which is, uh, relates to sales by the utility, um, you know, Maui County is, is about you know average in that field. I believe the Big Island is uh, um, ahead on that and producing more renewable energy. In other areas, you know, where we're really trying to look for is is changing the economy in general, right? Uh, it's not not having such a reliance on fossil fuel, and that 
a big portion of that actually is in the transportation sector. And, and this is where Maui is actually a little ahead of the other islands, you know, with the Jump Smart Maui program that uh, happened with, mm -hmm. uh, with the Japanese govern government and uh, Hitachi. Yeah. That brought a lot of electric vehicles onto the island, which is now an opportunity, mm -hmm. right, uh, for uh, for the county to continue moving those those ideas forward. So. So, you know, I think uh, we're, we're all working towards the same goal. Yeah, I coordinate with the other counties, we come up with other ideas. And at the moment, we're all going to uh, get together at the end of uh, November to work on our uh, climate adaptation plan and uh, see where we should go, what practices we should do, and make sure that we're all looking at it in the same way so it's, it's perfectly clear. I think it's great that you're having that program. Uh... And um, it's, it's an opportunity not only to discuss uh, climate and uh, sustainability vis-a-vis -vis cli climate, but also to compare notes on what, what each of the islands is doing, which each of the utility facilities is doing on those islands so that you can learn from each other and raise all the boats pretty much hopefully at the same time. So how, how, will, that, how will that play? I mean, who will be there? And will they have opportunity for that discussion? And what discussion do you contemplate? All of the counties will be there, and so many of the stakeholders throughout out, uh, Hawaii will also be there. And it'll be facilitated. Uh, and what we're trying to get to are some goals of defining our climate action plan to come up with what are the things that we're doing uh, with respect to the state's commitment to uh, uh, portions of the climate of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, and um, you know how are we all moving in that direction. Clearly, renewables are alive and well on Maui as we march forward to our 100% renewables goal. In our trip to Maui, we also visited Molokai. We'll show you what we learned in Molokai next time, so stay tuned for more about neighbor island energy on ThinkTech. We love to cover the neighbor islands. We've also recently visited Kauai and the Big Island, and videos of those trips are also on Spectrum OC16 and thinktechhawaii.com. And now let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash audio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list and get the daily email advisory of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our programs, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during any of our shows, Call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. More than ever, ThinkTech lives on the internet. In our ongoing efforts to push the innovation envelope, we've made this new animated video for our Give Thanks for ThinkTech Fun Drive. And we hope you'll help us on the Fun Drive. Okay, we're at the midpoint in our November month-long fundraising campaign, which we call Give Thanks to ThinkTech. Please help us reach our goal of raising $40,000 so we can continue to provide Hawaii's only digital media platform streaming 35 original talk shows a week with information, ideas, and news for our community. We extend our thanks to you for supporting ThinkTech Hawaii 
And we wish you and your families a holiday season full of love and enjoyment. Aloha. Go ahead. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Grateful thanks to our underwriters. The Annie Sinclair Knutson Memorial Fund. The Atherton Family Foundation. The Bernice and Conrad Von Ham Fund. Castle and Cook, Hawaii. The Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. Collateral Analytics. The Cook Foundation. The Hawaii Community Foundation. The Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners. Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, Hawaiian Electric Companies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Integrated Security Technologies, Kamehameha Schools, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, MW Group, the Omidyar Ohana Fund, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sidney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Eureka J. Sugimura. Thanks also to our viewers like you. Okay, Nicole, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Nicole does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for renewable energy, however and wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Nicole Horry. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.